So we'll move into the next talk, and I'm going to go through the first part of it really quick because we just talked about ablation. Again, my disclosures. And again, any treatment for AFib has two components. First, you have to use the right ablation technology. So if, I, I hope I convinced you, if you use a wrong device, you can do a maze and it won't work. So you can't really separate the approach from your technology you're using, and you have to use the ablation technology correctly. I'll actually tell you how we're presently evolved with the bipolar clamps to try to prevent this. Now, they do have a bit of a shortcoming in really fatty hearts, and we've, we've, we think we've developed a strategy to help overcome that. But the maze that we use, we use a combination of bipolar devices, which I've shown you, and what we do now, and, and it's a bit of a, of a approach that we've developed over time, is we clamp the tissue and we ablate without unclamping until our ablation time is less than 10 seconds. And we do two to three sets of that for each lesion of the maze. So that is exactly what I do. So we're doing generally about six ablations for each lesion. Now, every time you do a set, you have to clean the clamp because the minute it gets char on it, it doesn't work at all for the rest of the procedure. And that's one of the things I've seen in traveling that people don't do, and then they wonder why they don't get. So it would leave wherever that char is, it's leaving a gap in the line, which means your whole maze is ineffective. So you have to really be careful about cleaning the clamp. And the other thing that we've noticed recently, which we're in the midst of trying that, if you're using the dry uh, clamps, that you need to really um, watch this line. And I would have to say the mouse is kind of, oh, there it is, somewhere. Oh, where the heck it's going? Um, there it is. Um, yeah, the mouse is kind of broken. Um, the, um, you have to watch this line. If this curve is really flat, it's not transmural. Um, it's just not delivering enough tissue. Just remember, this is the inverse of resistance. So if it's flat, it's really high resistance. You probably have a lot of fat. You need to move the clamp. Sometimes on the second ablation, you'll get it to go, you'll get this conductance to go up. But it's really important to look at that curve and make sure it's right. Um, so just a last thing, just really try to dissect. If you're using the bipolar clamps, the fat away, verify the clamp is completely closed because air has really high resistance. And you have to clean the clamp. So those are the things that you really need to do. And visual confirmation is a bit unreliable. So we always confirm isolation of the pulmonary veins with pacing. And it's easy to do exit block. Um, and I'll show you on the movie. Um, these are the cryoablation devices that we use. Um, I tend to favor the reusable probes. I don't think they're that easy to get anymore, but they're very cost effective and they work great. These are the three we use. This is the one we use for minimally invasive. And these are the reusable disposable probes. And, and like I showed you before, they all work great. Um, and the only thing is like I had already said, just avoid the coronaries. Or if you do it on the beating heart, we do the right atrial lesion set on the beating heart. You don't have to worry. As long as there's warm blood going down the coronary, you will not freeze it. This is the maze for it, and it's a combination of RF and cryo. Most of the, the cryo is generally on a sternotomy just around the valves on a mini, which I'll show you the movie of. It's also behind the left pulmonary veins. And I would say that even the maze 3 never was FDA approved for the treatment of AFib, but the maze 4 has been FDA approved. The, the, both the operation and that technology has, is the only one yet approved for AFib. This is how we set up this, and I'm going to show you a quick video. But we bump the patient's chest up 30 to 45 degrees, and we use peripheral cannulation um, and do a, a right mini non-rib spreading thoracotomy. Um, on the terms of the left atrial lesions, one second, let me go back. This is the right atrial lesions through a sternotomy and here and a right mini thoracotomy. I'll show just the movie of the mini thoracotomy because that's really, in any patient, that's our default. We very rarely do any sternotomies anymore. It would have to be someone who has an absolute contraindication to a right thoracotomy. Through a sternotomy, I mean, the maze on the right side is really just a line of block between the superior and inferior vena cava, and then a line of block between um, this line and the tricuspid valve, and then another line of block that goes um, 
that really blocks conduction around the right atrial appendage. Um, this is how we do it, open with a sternotomy because it's so quick, but through a mini because we don't want to suck a lot of air and we have one venous cannula going up, we just do it through three purse strings, which works really great also. And then on, when you do the left atrial lesion set, um, on the sternotomy, you're gonna isolate the whole back of the left atrium and all four pulmonary veins. You're gonna take a line of block to the mitral valve, which is called the left atrial isthmus line, and then um, take the appendage and then take a line of block from there into one of the pulmonary veins. It doesn't matter much. Now, um, the EPs really think the appendage is really important in terms of recurrent AFib after catheter ablation, so maybe that also is not only to prevent stroke, but to prevent recurrent AFib. Through a mini, I'll show you the movie, but basically we do all this with RF and just isolate, complete the isolation of the pulmonary veins and back to left atrium with this um, T-shaped cryoprobe. And oversew the appendage. I still oversew the appendage. Certainly there are you can use the clip through a mini thoracotomy, but without rib spreading, um, it's still, to me, very cumbersome to get the clip in, and we've had very good results uh, with oversewing, but you need to do it in two layers, and I really feel like you need to put a pledge it right initially just to anchor it and keep it from ripping through, and with that, we've had very little recannulation, not zero, but in the low single digits. Um, in terms of pre-op, before you do a, a, a minimally invasive maze, um, you know, obviously you need to get an echo, um, look for a PFO. If so, you can close it at the time. Most importantly, check if you have atrial thrombus. If you do, you really don't want to cardiovert the patient into sinus rhythm to check for exit block. You need to really manage that thrombus first. And it's, it's actually initially that we used to feel that was an indication to go through a sternotomy, but actually it's much easier and safer to manage the atrial thrombus through a mini thoracotomy because you're really not manipulating the heart much before you clamp. And I, that's really our, the way we like to do it. And it, obviously if you have a lot of aortic insufficiency, more than uh, two plus or greater, we really don't favor the mini thoracotomy. It's just too hard to deliver pleage. Um, and then we always get a cardiac cath to look at the coronary anatomy and basically, um, here one second, let me just go back that with either, even with RF, you really don't want to make a living or a, a habit of ablating coronary arteries and it just helps to know if it's a right or left dominant circulation. A lot of times you're going to get this anyway because you're doing a mitral repair. Um, and then finally, we get a CT angiogram on every one. I really think that's really important. We look for both the safety of retrograde perfusion, but for most of the lone cases, they failed at least one catheter ablation, and you really want to look at pulmonary vein anatomy, make sure it's not anomalous, and make sure they aren't coming to you with pulmonary vein stenosis, which is a whole other problem, which you will get blamed for if you don't document it before. But it really helps, and it makes it a very safe procedure. Um, and then just look, we'll look at this, and this will go pretty quickly. This is how we mark. Like I said, we make a very small groin incision, and for women, a submammary incision, but we enter the chest through the fourth intercostal space. Um, we do use bronchial blockers. We usually don't use a double lumen tube, and then this is just prepped and draped. And the first thing is we just make a small incision and uh, isolate the femoral artery and vein. Um, and then we threw, the, actually yesterday it was excellent how you do that. We do it exactly the same. This, sorry, this is going, I feel like it's going a little fast, but we just use a soft tissue retractor, no rib spreading, and that really um, decreases the amount of pain. We put pericardial um, stitches in and bring them out through the ch lateral chest wall, and this is just to get it, but I will show you, we use a scope for these procedures. Um, and I'll show you that it will become much better, but we put a Blake drain. I, I, we talked yesterday about the Barracuda. That's also my favorite thing, and it's fantastic for this. And we just use a Blake drain and bubble CO2. It, through these little incisions, the CO2 works fantastic. You just never get any air in the heart. And then is there any way we could turn the lights down just a little bit? I think it will be a little easier to see this. It's really, uh, there's a lot of glare on the screen. Is there, any way we could do that? Okay. Well, um, we put a, a chest tube. This is, uh, usually we use a five millimeter, but this was a 10 millimeter port on this case. 
and we use a 30 degree high definition scope and this is just the, is there any way you could turn the lights down? Um, we first get this and then I mention the fat. Oh, thanks, that's great. We're gonna dissect the fat and then we make the space between the uh, superior pulmonary vein and the uh, right pulmonary artery and then dissect into the transverse sinus also. And then we'll obtain pacing thresholds from the right pulmonary veins. We cardiovert them into sinus and this is a little homemade device. What I really use now is a, a just a plain trans, uh, like a insulated forceps for a thoracoscopic case. We have this great, it's a renal pedicle clamp and it's a lot cheaper and works just as well as the lighted dissector. Um, it's perfect and we just put a umbilical tape around the veins and then clamp here. And you try to get as big a cuff of the atrium as possible. Um, and like I said, we ablate twice in the same spot until we get less than 10 seconds and then we do a set of three around the pulmonary veins. And then we confirm isolation uh, by pacing. It takes a second and it really can be done with all the things you just have. Um, and then we put the bipolar clamp through a purse string suture. This is just above the intraatrial septum midway between the superior and inferior vena cava. And we're going down onto the inferior vena cava and then up and onto the superior vena cava. And you can see that if we, you can see how it goes up there and we're going up and you wanna to try to keep it lateral and posterior to avoid the area of the SA node, but it's pretty hard to ablate the SA node with these clamps because they're pretty discreet. And then after doing the cava to cava lesion, we're gonna do the, what we call the right atrial free wall ablation and that's up toward the atrioventricular groove right near the free margin of the heart. And we mark the end of that ablation line with methylene blue. So now we've done what is basically like a T lesion. And then you put your second purse string suture um, right there, open in. And we're, you can see we're on bypass, but the heart's beating. So you're not, it doesn't require any clamp time. And then we cryoblate down to the tricuspid annulus. And we use, use this little endokipner and you can feel the probe in the right ventricle so you know you've crossed the tricuspid valve. And the last purse string suture is the base of the appendage. Um, so it's all through three, four O-proline sutures. We make a little thing and then we take the clamp and usually here you'll see we're coming down sort of the front of the atrium, but we've moved this ablation line to the other side of the atrial appendage, sort of the aortic side to avoid the SA node. And I think we've had less pacemaker implantation. And then we take a final, we use a linear cryoprobe, but you could use a disposable for this, um, but that, that works very, very well. And the same thing, you just need to make sure you've crossed the tricuspid valve and then you've done the ablations. Then we get ready, we put a, a cardioplegic cannula in, um, and this is all done with, a, like I said, with a five millimeter, 30 degree scope. We then put an atrial lift system in, very similar how you'd set up a, a mitral. This is exactly how we do the mitral also. And we use a transthoracic cross clamp, um, and you can sort of see both in the lower right hand, the inset, but that's just through a stab wound in the lateral chest wall. Um, you can use, we use regular blood cardioplegia, but certainly a lot of people are using Del Nido now, which gives you, a, a, you can do the whole maze. It usually takes about 40 minutes um, through this incision. And we use this atrial lift system. You can see it being put in. And this is Aztec now Atricure that we use. And you get a fantastic exposure. The maze is much easier to do than through a mini than the, when you're doing a mitral where you really have to see the mitral valve. But you can see, you can see it beautifully. And that ablation line went across the floor of the left atrium and behind you can see the left um, inferior pulmonary vein. And then that's the, through the transverse sinus. Now here's where you sometimes will get some fat in obese people. You just have to really be careful that you get a good ablation line here. And that's again, all, especially the pulmonary vein ablation lines, we all do a set of three and we don't unclamp. And this is the final um, bipolar ablation, which goes down to the uh, mitral. And you can see again, that's across the coronary sinus usually, but we'll end up and then we connect that to the mitral with that T-shaped cryoprobe is fantastic thoracoscopic because it's bent and it gets out of your way. It's really fantastic. And we also will freeze 
um, over the epicardial over the coronary sinus. And then we just go across the lateral ridge behind the left coronary veins. And usually this just takes two ablations with this T-shaped cryoprobe to connect the superior <laughs> line to the inferior line behind the left veins. And you can see, and again, we usually freeze for three minutes. And then the left atrial appendage, that just shows you how it's oversown. We usually do that in the beginning. Um, at, by the end of the case, after you've frozen, it's a little bit difficult, but that's what that looks like. We always check on echo, but you just have to be very careful. I would have to say that if you do this, that right in this area is the circumflex, so it's best on that side to take your bites a little bit into the atrial appendage and don't take a huge bite all the way to the annulus or you might impinge on the uh, circumflex. And this just is another look um, from a case that we took thoracoscopically, but you can see this is the T-shaped cryoprobe. And here it just was one ablation. And it, it ablates up, you can see, right to the, into the atrial appendage. So in a way that we don't really do a connecting lesion anymore um, in there because the, the cryo really, um, really does that for you. So we have looked at that. This is a paper we published three years ago now, comparing our results with that minimally invasive procedure to the sternotomy results we had. Because it's possible we did alter the maze, and it's possible maybe it wouldn't work as well. The answer is that it did work just as well, and we had much less complications. And we compared about 250 uh, sternotomy patients, because that's how we started doing the uh, we had a long history of the maze done that way and to about 104 right mini thoracotomy. So it was a big study. Um, the one thing, again, which I think I don't need to tell this audience, this is a bunch of minimally invasive surgeons, is that it definitely decreased our uh, complication rate. Um, and this is just overall major complications, also decreased our ICU and hospital length of stay although it did take us a little longer to do this. Now, this was a combination. This is most of these patients. It's a combination of loan and, and also mitral. So it's both loan and mitrals. And we had really no mortality in that. We've continued to do this. Um, we've never had a death with this procedure, um, either for a mini mitral maze or a mini maze. It's not to say there's no risk, but it is very low, and the patients have excellent recovery. If you don't do rib spreading, we send them back to full activity in two weeks. Um, and this is the results, which uh, have been very good. These are freedom from atrial arrhythmias at one and two years. And you can see at one year in the mini group, it was over 90%. And two years, it's still over 80%. We've now published out to five years in our overall series. And the maze four appears to be durable out to five years with about 80% freedom from atrial arrhythmias. And this is a look at that. And the good thing, and this is 576 patients, but the good thing if you do a full maze is it works for all types of AFib. And this is the results with paroxysmal in green and non-paroxysmal in yellow. And you can see even out at five years. And this is almost all with prolonged monitoring. We have just 80%. There is a continuing drop-off over time, which is interesting. Uh, but still, it is the most effective ablation procedure for AFib ever described. And if you can remember, the five-year results after catheter ablation, even at the best centers, is in the 20 to 30 percent range. So we have a much better, um, much better procedure, and really one that works for all types of AFib. Um, so which is the most important lesion in the maze? I get asked that all the time, and by far, I would tell you there's not even a question about that. It's You've got to isolate the whole back left atrium. If you don't do that, the rest of the maze is adding very little, I think. And this is from the same paper when we started doing the maze for. I just did one connecting lesion. But I thought if I didn't do this second lesion, that maybe we'd have better some better atrial function. And if everything is big rotors, we shouldn't have had to do this, right? We're just trying to block these big rotors. And back in 2000, and even now, that's pretty a popular theory of AFib. So I left out this lesion. That was it. Otherwise, the whole maze was done identically, and I did all these cases. So there was no surgeon variability or preference. But look at the impact if you look out. And this is freedom from both all atrial arrhythmias, ATAC, A flutter, atrial fib, and any drug. I don't care who started it, 
for whatever reason. So it's much more rigorous, but you can see if you look at the non-box that we left off that one lesion, that by five years only 33% were still in sinus and off drugs. So pulmonary vein isolation, if that's all you're gonna do, is gonna be somewhere below that. And our own success with just pulmonary vein isolation has been about 15% at five years and zero at 10. So this will be the best you're gonna do if you do less, certainly if you're not isolating the whole back left atrium. Now we don't know how much the actual rest of the maze adds, and this is a, a big group, and that's something we're looking at in a prospective study coming up. So in conclusion, I would just tell you, you can do a full maze. It's with the ablation devices, it's, it's relatively easy to do, and it cures, it has excellent success rates for all types of AFib. And right now, at least as surgeons, we're getting very few referrals of paroxysmal AFib, unless they're coming for a mitral also. So, you know, we really have to be good at the long-standing persistent and the maze, I think, is the only procedure really been shown to have really good results with that long-term. And there's no question that by using ablation devices, you can do a minimally invasive approach, and you'll see some other talks later in this session about that, which really has lowered the morbidity and increased the patient acceptance, but you still have the high success rate of the original maze procedure. Um, so with that, I will uh, quit my marathon session, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think I've made it on time.